Good morning, friends. Hope you are enjoying our study in 2 Peter. We are beginning chapter 2 this morning, and uh, we're moving along at a fairly good clip. We probably will be done with this book by, I'd say, sometime beginning maybe the middle of February at the latest. And most likely we'll have to go into another series, so uh, maybe be doing the Catechism series. I got some good feedback about that, so I'm excited about doing that as well if we get a chance to do that together. You know, I start off by saying false teachers are nothing new in our world. They have existed long before us, and no doubt they are going to continue long after we're gone until Christ returns. In fact, as early as Deuteronomy chapter 13, Moses warned of false teachers. And he warned about what would happen to them, but also to those who would follow after such heretical teachings. And Christ himself, Matthew chapter 24, warned that his follower, that followers of false teachers would creep in. These false teachers would come, people would distort Christ's words, and they would gather a following after them. The truth of God would be twisted and maligned, and they would craft these cunning lies of heresy. And Scripture is clear to us that God does not tolerate false teachers. In fact, the Old Testament says that they were to be stoned to death for peddling their artful lies. But sadly, in our world today, false doctrine and teaching is not only tolerated, it's oftentimes embraced more than it is pointed out or even eradicated among believers. You know, that's why we have people like your Joyce Myers and your Joel Osteens. Yes, I'm calling these people out by name. Even uh, to the extreme examples like your Koresh's and your Jim Jones. I mean, we've had false teachers through the gamut of history that try to take something and make it look like it's Christian when really it's not. And worse yet, instead of calling heresy what it is and rooting it out, in the interest of loving others, we tolerate false teaching as if it's some kind of noble sense of respect or love for that person. But you know what the problem is? Scripture hasn't changed on what it says. It doesn't tolerate heresy like our world does in the interest of trying to maintain some kind of relationship. Actually, the opposite is true. You know, Scripture tells us that we should speak the truth in love, according to Ephesians 4.15, and confront error because we love that person. And this means that even though our world continues to evolve culturally and morally, God's Word has not evolved with it, even though people have tried to get it to do so. And it shouldn't evolve with culture. You know, things like abortion, homosexuality, the transgenderism, the lying, the murder, the greed, the violence in our world. All of those things are still wrong according to Scripture, no matter what someone says about what they think that it should be right. And just because culture has embraced most of these things, it does not make them any less reprehensible in the eyes of God. And so rather than being embarrassed by biblical absolutes, what we should be doing is embracing them and standing firm on them and for them as we battle against this satanic evil that is around us. And what Peter is about to share with us here in these verses this morning, chapter 2, verses 1 through the first part of verse 3, these are just as relevant for us today as it was 2,000 years ago when he first wrote these things down. So let's look at what he says here and let's take a high regard for the exhortation that he gives us this morning. Chapter 2, verse 1. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. So right from the beginning, but false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. And he throws in that word, but, referring back to what we talked about previously. After telling us that there is no part of Scripture that is man's idea, 
but it's actually from the divine inspiration of God on those who wrote it. Here's the bad news with some of the good. There will be false prophets. There will be false teachers that will rise among the people. Some of them will be outside the church. But sadly, very often they will rise from within the church. How do I know? Well, it's because Peter says it. But let me also remind you that Christ predicted these things would happen in Matthew chapter 24. And when the church begins to be allured by the way of the world and how it works, false teachers are going to capitalize on that. They're going to rise up to obscure divine truth and throw in man's wisdom and make it sound like it's of God. But actually, the church is one of the main spheres of influence that Satan tries to have in seeking to dilute the gospel and to try to deter people from embracing absolute truth and exchanging it for something that looks and it smells like the gospel, when in fact it's actually spiritual poison. Notice the second part of verse 1. He says, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies. So what are these false teachers going to bring to the table? Peter says that they're going to be these destructive heresies. But notice, though, they're not just destructive. They're secretive. Did you notice that in the second part of verse 1? Listen, I have known churches that have had to dismiss Sunday school teachers or small group leaders because they began to deviate from fundamental, fundamental truth found in Scripture and they began to mix in a little bit of their own opinions or the teachings of some unorthodox people like your Rob Bells and others. And I've seen heretical teachers garner a following and a publishing audience in our world so large that then they would argue that you're the one who's heretical when you confront their fallacies. And the common denominator in all of this is that Peter is telling us these people, they're not going to come into your Sunday school class or your men's Bible study group, sit down and say, hey, I want to teach you something today that is completely unorthodox. In fact, it's actually not true at all, but I'm going to try to spin it in such a way that's going to convince you that it could be plausibly true and could plausibly come from Scripture. I mean, that would be obvious, right? We would all look at him and go, well, you're crazy. See you later. We'll get another teacher. Peter warns they're going to do this craftily. They're going to do this secretly. They're going to slip these things in. Again, as I said before, just because they're doing something wrong doesn't mean they're stupid. Some of them are quite smart in their approaches. They know how to act like the serpent in the garden back in Genesis 3. They know how to add just enough reasonable doubt so that you can't be sure what you believe or whether or not it's true or not by the time they're done. That's their whole motive. That's their whole point. And then you look at the third part of verse 1. It says that they even deny the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So what does that mean? So now Peter's even going on to say that they deny the very master who bought them and they're incurring destruction upon themselves. Now let me ask, does that phrase throw you for a loop? Well, listen, it doesn't have to. Let's break this part of the verse down so that it becomes a little clearer for you. Not only have these false teachers risen up within the church, they have craftily injected their false teachings into those whom they have influence over. And it's so bad that Peter tells us that they even deny the master who bought them. Now, without spending a whole lot of time on this phrase, because we could really dive into the theology of this, but what Peter is sharing with us is simply that these false teachers are claiming to be followers of Christ. I mean, they may, they may claim to believe in the deity of Christ, or that he's the Savior, or that he even rose from the dead. But they still deny him as the sovereign Lord of all and over all, by what they teach. I mean, they claim Christ as their Lord and Savior, but in, in fact, they're denying him flat out by the heresy that they teach is what Peter's getting at. They may claim an allegiance to Christ, hence the phrase, the master who bought them, but it becomes abundantly clear through their false teachings that they are completely denying such claims and were never truly one of Christ's. 
They are, as one commentary stated, they are unregenerate enemies of biblical truth. It's not that they were saved and then they lose their salvation now because they're teaching heresy. It's because they pretended to be saved and now, as by the manifestation of their teaching these false doctrines, they are only confirming that they were never one of his because they are denying their own Lord and Savior that they should be proclaiming as king and sovereign ruler of all through what they're teaching, which does not align with Scripture. And this is why they're bringing upon themselves this swift destruction, because they are no more a Christian than the keyboard that I use to write my notes with. They're talking out of both sides of their mouth. They play the hypocrite by saying one thing and then they're doing something completely opposite. And their duplicitous actions are leading people astray. And God says he's going to bring certain and swift judgment upon these people unless they repent. Now notice in verse 2, And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them the way of truth will be blasphemed. You know, interestingly, one of the most glaring characteristics of these false teachers is they're bent towards sensuality. And I don't just mean in a sexual nature, but their, their lust, their immorality, their greed, etc. You know, Peter says, and I would imagine Peter saying this almost with a heart of grief here, that many are going to follow their sensuality. And I say that because remember back before where Peter said, I want my legacy to be that of reminding people the truths of God. So I can only imagine he's probably got a heavy heart as he's writing this, realizing that people are going to be led astray, realizing that people are wanting to forsake the saving truth of God for these false narratives here. And so false teachers are going to use their platform for this kind of gratification and try to convince others to follow suit. And because of them, Peter says, the way of truth will be blasphemed. They will malign what the true message of the gospel says, which will only cause confusion. It's only going to cause confusion for those who are without Christ, for those who are on the outside and looking in. The gospel is going to be maligned because of their actions as they use Christianity as a platform for their own self-gratification. But now notice in the last verse this morning, we're just going to look at the first half of verse 3. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. These are Peter's final words to us this morning. In the interest of their own greed and their own selfish gain, they are going to exploit you with false words. Now, I want you to notice that that word exploit here conveys that they will attempt to basically make themselves wealthy, to line their own pockets financially or otherwise by preying upon those who would be willing to listen to these fairy tales, essentially. And worse, they will enjoy capitalizing on those who would see them be successful as they, then these false teachers, drain those who look up to them and even see them as a spiritual mentor. Now, there's one other interesting word in this phrase. And in their greed, they will exploit. We talked about that one. They will exploit you with false words. This word false, it's actually the same Greek word where we get our word for plastic. And originally, this word meant something that was not fully authentic, but it was actually a close facsimile. It's a great word for this. And my reason for pointing this out is that to remind us that heresy will often look like orthodoxy. False teachers are going to do a magnificent job. And I am not trying to put them on a pedestal. I'm just calling it like it is. They are going to try to be as artful as they can at dressing up their lives in a way that appear to be divine truth. As if it's some new revelation from Scripture. It is some, you know, secret key to unlock part of the spiritual life to where you will be healthy, wealthy, and wise, and so forth. Some new insight that's going to make your life amazing that no one else has figured out before. Hmm, that should, that should kind of be a red flag there. You're going to experience some new levels of success and happiness. That's this plastic kind of thing here to exploit you with false, plastic words. These facsimiles, they look like the real thing, but they're not. 
So what do we do? What do we take away from this this morning? Well, first, I want to encourage us to hold fast to what is true. Let God be true, as Paul said in Romans, and let every man be a liar. Where do your beliefs come from? Let me just ask that evaluative question. You know, I spoke with someone last week, and in our conversation, the person made a comment, and to which I replied to them, I said, okay, I understand what you're saying, but where is that in Scripture? And honestly, their response was, well, I don't really know. It's just something I've heard, and, I, and I've heard before, and something that someone said to me. But friends, listen to me. And I'm not trying to throw that person under the bus. I'm just trying to point out this example for this reason. That's not enough. It's not good enough. We cannot be led around by old wives' tales and denominational cliches. We must be led by the divine, absolute truth of Scripture. There is nothing else for which we can stand on. It is our only sure foundation. Friends, check what you believe. Make sure that it aligns with Christ's infallible word that is given to us in the canon of Scripture. It is by these words that we will be held accountable. There is no excuse for us believing something apart from the Bible. So my exhortation to us, my encouragement to us this morning is that may you be better at wielding the weapon that divides soul from spirit and joints from marrow. Because what this world needs more of is real truth. Not our opinions, not our perspectives, but the absolute infallible truth contained in this book that you and I get to hold together. And I pray that you will continue to dig into it as you go throughout this week. Friends, I hope that helps you and encourages you. And I look forward to sharing more with you next time.